as Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana inna ka anta al-alimu al-hakim. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bi ma'antu al-alimuna wa zidna min fadlika ilmu la ta'alima inna ka ala kulli shayin qadir. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we are at lesson number seven in watching one's words, the fiqh of guarding one's tongue. And uh, we're going to speak about four of the sins of the tongue today, or, you know, four things that a Muslim should watch out for. And uh, to, to begin with, those, uh, the first one is asking about questions in which people often make mistakes. Okay, that's the first one. Asking questions in which people often trip up and make mistakes. The second thing is, the second sin of the tongue is to ferret out people's faults, to, to try to find out what people's flaws and faults are. That's the second one. The third one, if we could put up the, the slide there. yeah. Uh, the third one is to show satisfaction when another Muslim falls into problems, when something happens to another Muslim or another person. And number four is obscenity. So using obscene language and obscene speech. The first one uh, is the Bismillah. is a sual. Just a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, the first one is about a sual and al mushkilat. Asking about another's mistakes. But it's not just another person's mistakes, it's about in general things that are things that will cause people to reveal mistakes. Things that will cause make issues, controversial issues. Imam Nahlawi says, Yahruma su'alu an al mushkilat wa mawadi al ghalat li taghlit wa tahjil. It is forbidden to ask about another person's mistakes or to ask about very, very kind of very difficult controversial matters or to get into their blunders in order to, um, uh, to show that they've made a mistake or to embarrass them, right? To, to embarrass somebody. And this is unlawful. And it is haram to do this to just ask questions to trip people up, right? And now it is unlawful to do this. Why? Because when you do something like that, and we'll look at it, we'll look at examples. The ruling is haram to do this because when you do this, you make someone feel embarrassed. You make someone feel um, feel stupid in front of everyone else. You make people laugh at them. And so immediately what happens is you ask someone a question to trip them up and you re they realize they make a mistake and then everyone starts to laugh at them or they think that, um, you know, people, this person is not smart or intelligent and they feel sad about it, right? Now, what's an example of that? Actually, do you guys, can you guys say an example of that? When somebody asks a question just to, just to kind of, you, you know that they're not asking a genuine question. They're just asking a question to kind of, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That's, that's actually the, 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 nec the next topic. Yeah, no, 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 that's good. It's a good, it's a because you're actually, um, you're actually right, but you're kind of, that's what I'm going to talk about in the next one. In this one, it's for example, you know, you're asking, you're asking people about a topic that would embarrass them in such a way. Yeah, okay, it could, it could, it could work because you, you ask them something, a question in such a way that it reveals something that they don't want to reveal, right? They don't want to reveal, you know, um, Asking somebody, somebody mentions something about some model or something like that, and then you'd be like, "Well, how do you know that?" And they're like, "Oh, <laughs> you know, it's like they're, they're, you're caught in an embarrassing situation, right?" And you 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 feel shy about something, or it could be, you know, you ask about, um, for example, you're sitting around, you know, as they say in the in, in in Western discourse, like there's two things you don't discuss at the dinner table: religion and politics. Muslims, of course, <laughs> that's the only the two things they discuss at the dinner table. But in, you know, in polite Western society, it was considered, you know, when someone comes for dinner, you know, you don't bring certain things up. You're going to get into a situation, you know, where you don't know if where their political views are. You don't know what they think about something. So, you know, I was sitting <laughs> yesterday with somebody and, um, you know, two people and they met each other after many years. Right. 
And one guy was going off about, you know, his views on a certain thing about vaccines or something like that and whatever. And I could see the look on the other person's face and he was just quiet. Okay. <laughs> when, when the person left, I whispered to him, I think you might feel this way about this situation. He's like, oh, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> you know, so you, you have to be careful how you ask certain things, bring th certain topics up in front of other people and you make them feel like tested by it. Or you ask someone something off the top of their head that they should know perhaps. But it's like, if you quiz somebody on it right away, so I, I, you know, you might make this mistake sometimes, you go ask a scholar, actually somebody told me this. Um, when I was doing my studies, uh, when we were in, when I was in the madrasa, um, I went and I asked my teacher when he was surrounded by a bunch of students about a ruling in fiqh, you know, something, something kind of relatively simple, but you know, it just off, so I said, oh Sheikh, is this, does such and such break your fast? And I saw him go, uh, um, and he went like, uh, um, uh, uh, look in this book, it's right there. Somebody pulled me aside later on and said, listen, it's good to ask questions, no, no problem with that. But sometimes when you're in a different social setting in a situation and you pop a question, you don't know, is that the right, is that the person that you ask these types of questions to? There's some types of people, like you can ask them anything, right? There's some types of people where you have to make sure, like do they review this stuff? Is that their specialty or not? And so by asking them a question on the spot, now they're embarrassed. And they're like, oh no, and everyone's watching. So if you say the wrong thing, you know, now, now that person, feels, now I didn't do it purposely, of course, right? But it was an example of sometimes people will, um, you know, put up a, you know, in a masjid, you know, there's a, a speaker that comes and sometimes they'll put a question in the crowd to create a problem. They'll, they'll put the question in the crowd or like they'll, hey, excuse me, Sheikh, I have a question. And, you know, the type that says, um, is, now there's some, someone in the masjid who's saying X, Y, Z. Is this halal or haram? Or is this, is this good or is this bad? And the guy's like, you know that there's some politics inside the masjid that are happening. Or, you know, someone, yeah, you know, someone, husband and wife, and they're not really agreeing with each other. The husband says, oh, is it, uh, is it halal to do X, Y, Z? Like watch an Indian movie or something in front of everybody and the wife is like turning red or something, you know. So these are questions that you put up to bring out people's faults, to catch them when they slip. It often happens as well when reporters ask um, politicians questions. And they're asking them questions just to lay a trap for them. And then they want them to mess up and say something wrong. They want them to say something controversial. And they take that one little thing, they erase everything else in the interview, and they just find the place where that person slipped. And people do this to ulama as well. An entire lecture, mashallah, the person spent his own entire life serving deen. One thing wrong. Some question came up about gender or race or something where, come on, the person's a little bit older, they're not up with all the thing, they say something and it spills out in a wrong way. They didn't mean it, but it's just there for you to say, ah, now we can cancel this person. So this is the type of thing, in, in modern days you would call it canceling, although Imam Nahlawi obviously is not talking exactly about canceling. Now, there are times when asking about another person's mistakes um, to learn or teach is okay. So asking about something, so, so for example, can a teacher ask their students a question that they may not be able to handle just to test them, see what you know. So you're going to quiz your student and say, all right, tell me, what is this, this, this? This happened to me. My teacher will say, you know, my teacher said, what did you study in this, this, in Mantik? And I say, I studied this book in Mantik. And like right away the question came, okay, what is the definition of this? And I'll be like, uh, you know, thank God he didn't ask me in a public setting. It's like, um, I don't know, you know? So then why is he doing that? Because he was, the teacher's doing that to bring out, okay, did you really study this? Or did you read the text? Or did you sit in the classes of the text, for example? So sometimes a scholar, a teacher may do this to the student to see, do you really understand or not? Sometimes they do it to, um, to sharpen the student's mind as well, to get you to reflect a little bit. You know, often we do this, like, you know, a teacher will throw out a question that is not easy for students to answer, but he wants or she wants the students to be able to like start using their, their process the, the powers of their thought and to and it might be they might get it wrong okay no that's not true that's not correct ah that's correct that's how you do it the prophet sallam, as we know he was sitting in a in a group of companions and he asked about that uh one of the uh, trees that resembles a believer the most right and so different of the sahaba started to say it's this it's this it's this and they were all wrong later on ibn umar who was the son of Umar al khattab was sitting there with his father and he was a boy at this time he was a teenager and as they were walking home, he, after this majlis, Ibn Umar said, 
I knew the answer to that question. It was the date palm tree, the nakhla. And everyone was saying it was a different type. So Omar said, why didn't you just say the right answer? So this is an example of the Prophet ﷺ asking a question that, that people couldn't possibly know exactly what the right answer is, but you try. So there, it is possible to, to bring out something um, to make people, you know, for example, Imam Bukhari, subhanAllah, when they came, when he came to um, Baghdad, I believe it was, all of the, the big Hadith scholars, like he, he, was, he was new, but the, his reputation had preceded him as like a huge Hadith scholar. This is before, obviously, he compiled his Sahih, and this is before he became like known as the, the top Hadith scholar in Islam. So they were like, let's check this guy out, right? Let's, 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 let's see, is he really the big Hadith scholar? So they gave him 10 Hadiths, but they said, okay, have you heard this Hadith? And they, the chains of narration, they mixed up the chain of narration in each one. So I said, have you heard the hadith that goes so-and-so, said from so-and-so, said from so said from so-and-so, that the Prophet said this, and what about this hadith? And they, they put chains and they mixed up a little bit in the chain. And he said for each of them, I have never heard this hadith. I've not heard this hadith. I've not heard this hadith. Now people are like, what? What is that? It's a well-known hadith. But then he said, rather, I have heard it this way. And he went back and he corrected all the chains. And then he said the hadith. And he went, in by memory, went back and corrected them all. And remembered the wrong one and, re and remembered the right one. So in this one, in this situation, they were asking the question, but was their intention to make Imam Bukhari look bad? Or was it to test Imam Bukhari that, okay, you are preserving the hadith of our Rasul You're saying this book is Sahih al-Bukhari, the most authentic book, let's say, after the, the Quran. Like, you better know your stuff because you're, you know, our deen is resting on a lot of your shoulders. So, so this is why when... Uh, when you test someone like that, obviously now it goes back to the intention of the people testing Imam Bukhari. We obviously assume because they were scholars as well, inshallah we assume that they were doing it to protect deen. But, you know, could that jealousy get in the heart of somebody, even a scholar? You know, so you ask questions. In fact, they talk about um, another aspect. There's a, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that was not mentioned in the text, but it was mentioned in, um, the, in the longer text of Imam Nahlawi. And it said, Muawiyah who said, uh, let's see, and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi forbade asking people about topics that put, put people in mistakes and slips. So this is actually a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's an aghluta? Agh, like ghalat means, what does ghalat mean? It means like you're wrong. I mean, what it means is like a blunder, like a mistake, right? So an aghluta is when you ask someone a question and, and they're going to they're gonna trip up. They're gonna, you're going to trip them up because it's a difficult question to answer or it's a very controversial one. And you find yourself in a situation where all of a sudden you have to take sides and you're not ready to exactly say it publicly. The, the, people, the reason why people do this is to bring down someone in the eyes of someone else. So it's asking a scholar an extremely detailed question and then you bring them down in the eyes of the public, so you put yourself up. And this is why that type of question is haram. You don't ask people that question. In fact, um, Ibn Mas'ud used to say, Anvartukum su'ab al mantiq. He says, I'm warning you about asking people extremely detailed questions. You know, research questions. It takes a long time. You just can't answer off the top of your head. But when people see that you don't know the answer, the common person thinks, oh, this guy, this guy doesn't know. He's not smart. He's not intelligent. So you're trying to bring down that scholar, right? Um, the other thing is that the, the Sahaba used to say, when, for example, Ubay ibn Ka'b, the Sahabi, عنه, people used to come and ask him, okay, um, what is the answer to this question? And he would say, has this actually occurred? Like this question you're asking me, I'll give you an example. My, my son asked me, um, Baba, would you rather get punched in the tummy by a gorilla or bitten in the leg by a shark? I'm like, <laughs> that's what he asked me. Like, if, you know, he's like a young boy, you know? I, and it's so cute how he asked it, but I was like, mashallah, but I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know. You know, I, I'm like, stop, stop asking me that question. Like, I, <laughs> so the thing is that it, that's okay for a 10, 9 year old to ask. But when, when a person puts up their hand in a gathering, shake, this, this, or this, this, this. Like, and you're like, so a waving cab said, has this actually occurred? And he said, no. And they said, then ask me when it occurs. When you actually have a problem like that, don't give me a theoretical question that you made up in your, you know, in your living room and you came to like test me, you know? And Imam, Imam uh, Ozai said that these kinds of questions are the most evil types of questions that you can get, right? These very, very, um, uh, you know, questions that get you get people 
into trouble. And the other thing is, or it, it confuses a person in the middle of their speech. So the person is giving a lesson, you put up your hand and you ask a question that like just throws off the attention of the person. Uh, SubhanAllah, it went, once, <laughs> what happened was Imam Shafi. Now, what they say is, this type of a question is haram to, uh, uh, to ask someone with that intention, right? To, to trip them up. But if someone asks you that type of question and you have to retort back, it's permissible in a way that they asked you. So, so that's interesting, isn't it? Because Imam Shafi was sitting uh, in the company of the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid, big, you know, major, famous Khalifa of Islam. And Imam Shafi, the, 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 the great scholar of Islam, as we all know, he was sitting and somebody, like a rival, tried to come and start to try to ask him a question to make him look, look dumb, right? So the rival asked him the question, and amazingly, Imam Shafi answered the question right away. So he, he answered the question. Then he asked the person back a question. Okay, fine. Let me ask you a question now. Um, a person dies and leaves 400 dirhams behind in inher inheritance, and his sister only gets one dirham. How is that? And the person was like trying. Now, inheritance is a very complex science. It's like, you know, it's mathematical. There's percentages. There's conditions. If this person is alive, if that person is alive, how do you? And so he was flabbergasted. He didn't even know what to say. And so Imam Shafi then answered the question and said, it's because, you know, she has, she leaves, uh, you know, the person passed away and he left behind 12 brothers and a mother and a wife and a sister. And that's why out of 400, she only got one. Like, solved the question for him right away and made that person look stupid in front of the Khalifa. But they say that the reason why is because someone's trying to make you look stupid. So if you are trying to defend yourself and try to tell that person back off, then you can kind of retort or flip it in such a way. That's obviously not, it's not mean. He's not, you know, but he's just saying, hey, what do you think about this? And the person backs off, realizes, okay, okay. And, 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 and it's interesting because the proof of that, they say, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَجَزَاءُ سَيَّتٍ سَيَّتٌ مِثْلُهَا That when you, <laughs> isn't the reward of doing a bad thing a bad thing as well. So what it means is that, you know, it's it's a kind of a, that's not the meaning of the ayah, but it shows you someone tries to test you in a certain way to defend yourself, you can give a smart answer back, right? Because sometimes the only way to deal with a, a smart aleck, you know, is to, you know, you know to, to be smart back with them, uh, as long as you don't cross the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other, the other, the next topic is a taftish an uyub in nas, right? A taftish an uyub in nas, which means to search out people's faults. Taftish, you know what they call taftish is like when you go to the airport and um, you know put your bag on a trolley and they open up the bag and they're looking in all the things and they even take out your baby bottle and what is this? Like drink it, prove it. You know, that's taftish, getting into every little thing. And then you're like, oh my gosh, like they're opening up, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, everybody's, you know, horror story. They're opening up your thing and this is where you have your undergarments and they're like, hmm, you know, <laughs> in front of that's called taftish. Right? To look at something. And what do you do? Why do people hate that? Don't you hate that when, when that happens? When you go to the airport and the guy's like taking out every little thing? It's like, don't go in there. You know? <laughs> you know, you're hiding your personal stuff, you know? You know, because everyone will see things that you don't want people to see. And they're gonna air out your dirty laundry in that respect. Like, oh man, I just packed it so quickly. You know, you have to show everybody all the things I'm packing. And this is the same way in terms of speech, in asking people questions that, as you said, will bring out the faults that they did. So let's talk about, let's see what Imam Nahlawi is saying. That asking and searching out people's faults, specifically about the faults of other people, is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. Where did he forbid it? In Surah Hujurat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Right? Do not spy. Because spying is not just by looking into the keyhole, you know, to see what the person is doing or, you know, tapping someone's phone. That's like that's a type of spying. But a type of spying is also because when you generally when you ask a person a question, especially in some cultures, the idea of like it's not your business, it's not a, it's not a it's not a really easy way of saying it. So once you ask the question, you put the person on the spot. Right. I'll, I'll give you an example. Like I'm in a, I was in a taxi in Jordan, and the common question was always, um, you can ask this to foreigners. Like, how much do you make? How much money do you make? I have, I have a job here. I live here. How much money do you make? And I, and I was like, ah, uh, and I would say, oh, I, you know, alhamdulillah, I mean, it's enough, alhamdulillah. And they said, no, no, how much do you make? No, how much do you make? How much do you make? And I'm uncomfortable with that question, 
So then I would say, listen, in my culture, in my country, we don't ask people how much we make. And then you'd say, okay, fine. How much rent do you pay on your apartment? <laughs> you would go the opposite way to try to build back my salary and his mind. So it's like you're asking questions that, that people like, you know, you're spying on people now, you know? Um, and so when it's applied to the shameful points of a Muslim, now what is that like, right? It's like saying things like, oh, um, asking somebody, so when you were back in school, did you ever do sin X, Y, Z? Did you ever smoke? Did you ever have a girlfriend? You know, when you ask people these questions, now they're like, oh no, because it's like, maybe they did something like that, but they don't want to say it. So now they're going to, they're, they're, now they're thinking between lying, which they probably should do in this case, right? You don't have to reveal your sins to people. Um, and now they're like, but wait, am I supposed to tell the truth? Am I supposed to lie? And now they're embarrassed. And the look that you caught them with, right? Is all of a sudden like, well, how, how, oh, you know, and this happens all the time. Like, you know, you ask a question to a person and now they've left that lifestyle behind. They've left that lifestyle behind. Oh, but didn't you used to go, didn't we used to see you late night in this one place, like hanging out? Oh, I saw you talking to this guy, like, you know, whatever, you know, and it's like, oh God, you know, you're, and you've moved on from that. So this type of thing is, is, is something that is very uh, shameful. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu whoops, the formatting is a little bit off. The Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّكَ إِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَوْرَاتِ النَّاسِ أَوْ سَدَّهُمْ أَوْ كِتَّ أَنْ تُفْسِدَهُمْ Right? The Prophet Sallallahu said, um, if you search out for people's shameful points, you corrupt them. Or you almost corrupt them. Okay, why is that? Because when you start asking people their business, in fact, this is the reality of all of us, to be honest. We all have things that people know, and we all have things that nobody knows. There are skeletons in everyone's closet here, right? And in reality, the beauty of, for example, like why is it called awrat and nas? The aura, what is the aura? What's the aura? What's the aura? You know your aura. You cover your aura, right? So your aura is like your nakedness, right? So it's like that place where, you know, but the, the, the term it comes from is where you feel ashamed to show anybody else. That's why you cover your nakedness. So that the beauty of clothes is that it covers us up. Basically, by asking people's questions and searching out their faults, it's like looking at their shame, like their, their nakedness in that sense, things they want to hide. Now, when you start taking that out, like let's say people have a habit, right, that they don't want anybody to know about. It's a brother who comes to the masjid, a sister who's involved in the MSA, you know, and they have just this one little corner of their life that, that you know, their Muslim friends don't know about, or it's like it's not any of any, anybody's business. It's something that they're dealing with on their own or something they do on the side between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now you're like, oh, um, can I use your laptop? Yeah. And you're like, okay, search bar, history. And it's like, um, you know, can you not look at that? Or, you know, oh, wow, it's your phone. Like, let me look through your pictures. Like, no, 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 let me, you know. So you, so you immediately put the person on the spot. Now what happens is when you catch someone, so for example, the teenage boys, and this is something as parents as well, we, got, we have to do. The minute you try to go into every single thing that your kid is doing, even in their private time where they want to hide it, and you bring up everything they're doing, they lose face in front of you. And when someone loses face in front of you, their shame goes away bit by bit by bit, right? Like, have you seen um, people who, um, for example, I mean, it's weird to see people when they have no shame sinning in front of their parents. You know, whether it's like, let's say a guy smokes in front of his parents or somebody swears in front of his parents very openly, right? The thing is, if you, you have to sometimes pretend not to see things that happen with people. That's very, very important. So for example, right? Then Abu Darda, the, the Sahabi continues and he says, كَلِمَةٌ سَمِعَهَا مُعَاوِيَةً مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ نَفَهَا اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِهَا this hadith that I just mentioned, that if you search out people's shameful points, you will corrupt them. Because instead of hiding their sins, yeah, sure. Because instead of hiding their sins, what they end up doing is they say, well, what's the point I hide my sins? Everybody knows now that I'm addicted to vaping or whatever it is. Might as well just vape openly. Like, what's the big deal? You already know I'm sinful now. And this is a problem. I was hiding, you know, you were hiding, the girl was hiding her boyfriend before. Now they went and they told everybody on the street, this girl's going out with this guy. And then she says, you know what? I don't care now. You, got, you, you, you guys have trashed me already. So that's why the Prophet is saying, you're going to corrupt people by constantly going into the bad things that they're doing. Leave people alone. 
And this is why this hadith was narrated by who? By Muawiyah anhu, who became Khalifa after Hassan. This is a Sahabi, Muawiyah, who became the Khalifa and he ruled, this, he ruled the Muslim empire for a long time. And he was very, very wise. They considered him very wise. And they said that he's the one, Abu Darda says he heard this hadith from Rasulullah and he implemented it and it benefited him. Because a ruler, if he starts to spy on everybody, he's going to find out all their sins. So that means, you know, oh, they're, you know, pious Muslims, but in the evening they, they, they take a little whatever, they drink something or whatever, smoke something in their privacy. Just a couple of people who are kind of involved in it. Now you kick down the door with your cops and you, you, you bring, bring it out and you put it on the papers and scandal and everything. And, you know, so this is something that breaks apart communities. Now, if it's something wrong happening to someone else, no doubt, that's uh, sometimes it might be wajib to obviously speak up and stop that. We're talking about people's personal sins. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ also said, and, and also what intention are you doing this with? Is it to bring that person down, right? The Prophet ﷺ said in, in the next hadith, in fact, he climbed up on the mimbar and he's, he, he proclaimed with a very loud voice. Ya ma'ashara man aslama bi lisanihi wa lam yufdih wa lam yufdil imanu ila qalbi. O to the group of people, O people who have become Muslim with their tongues, but faith has not yet entered their hearts. Listen up. Do not harm other Muslims and do not shame them and do not ferret out their faults. You know, like a ferret digs in the ground to dig up an acorn. Do not ferret out their shameful points. Because whoever ferrets out the shameful points of his Muslim brother or sister, Allah will follow up that person's shameful points. And whoever's shameful points Allah decides to dig up, Allah will disgrace that person, even if that person is in the middle of his house. And look, subhanAllah, look at how prescient the hadith of the Prophet is. These days, you could be in the middle of your house, but you're just online. And scandal could break out. And how many people do this? You know, they, they go through the faults of other people, and then something was found on your hard drive. Something, what well, you found some inconsistency at work. And now you're in the, in the middle of the, your house. You don't even have to leave the house. The internet is already spreading the word that you've been, you know, uh, you know uh, accused of a crime, or you've done this scandal, or whatever. So if Allah wants to bring you down, so that's why the, the, Allah, the Prophet is saying, don't start trying to dig up the faults of your brothers and sisters. Uh, if Allah wants to come after you, He'll come after you. And this is why, because when you start digging up other people's faults, maybe they made tawbah for it. Maybe they made tawbah for it, and Allah, between them and Allah, that, that sin is gone. But you bring it up as though you're the judge of people. So Allah says, oh, oh yeah, okay, you think you're the judge of people, right? You didn't make tawbah for that thing that you did. Let me bring that up. Search, you know, website XYZ, you know, um, uh, you know texts with female XYZ. Let's, let's bring that out to light. And people get so humiliated by that. So may Allah protect us from humiliation, from humiliating other people, and protect us as well, subhanAllah, and let us make tawbah before anything else uh, comes out. So this is where, uh, that's why you had a question. Can you give me an example? So the question was, sorry, we didn't run a mic to you, um, that it, how broad is this idea of bringing up people's faults? And does it encompass, um, you know, for example, mentioning something embarrassing but not a fault, such as? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, good point. So this is why I, I should have clarified. The aura is, for example, your aura, the, the, your, your, your nakedness, is not, it's not a wrong thing to have. It's just something you don't want people to know. So that's why um, these points is not about people's it's sins is one thing, but even faults, right? Like, um, so like, would you, like, let's say you're in, a, in, in, in your class, would you want the teacher to say, um, okay, Abdullah, you know, everybody passed, Abdullah failed. You feel pretty, you know, it's like embarrassing. So you feel like your heart is broken. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. So it's a, it's a very good question. It's not just about sins. It's about anything that can embarrass that person or even um, trip them up. Like, so for example, you know, revealing the faults in how they speak, um, things like that. Um, revealing like this person has a certain condition or something that they didn't want people to know, you know, stuff like that. Alhamdulillah. But thank you for asking the question. Um, uh, next, the next sin that we'll talk about. Well, let's see what. 
The next thing that we'll talk about is al-idhar, uh, idhar al-shamata bil-muslim. Sorry, there's a little typo there in the Arabic. It is displaying satisfaction or joy at another Muslim's troubles or problems, right? Is uh, displaying satisfaction at another Muslim's troubles. And in fact, there's like a kind of common thread running through everything that we've talked about today, right? Um, and that is that when you just have ill will towards someone else, you just have insincerity towards another person. So what's an example of, of that, right? So th you have a competitor and that competitor, like let's say you're in a business and that competitor uh, is doing well, your Muslim brother, and all of a sudden something happens to their store and has to close down. They lose profit. Or, you know, something happens where there's a customer, uh, there's a defect in their product, there's been a recall, and all of a sudden you're like happy because you can sell more your, of your product. Right? That's an example of another Muslim got into trouble. Or like, for example, um, a girl is jealous of her friend, or let's say a man is jealous of his friend, that they married a, a very beautiful spouse or a very wealthy spouse, and you haven't been able to find someone like that, let's say. Now their marriage, gets, they get divorced. And inside you're gloating, you're like, ha, 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 ha. You know? it's, I mean, it's a really an evil thought if you really think about it, right? But it's this idea of just being happy when you see someone else in problems. Now, it's easy to say that this is wrong to do when that person is your friend. But I tell you, when that person is your enemy or you have some sort of beef with that person, it's, 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 it's a big test from Allah to, be, to commiserate with them in their, uh, in their downfall too, in their problems. Because, you know, when some, let's say somebody insults you and, you and you're upset with them. They, you know, they insult you. And then as they're walking away from you, they trip and fall and break their ankle. What's the immediate thing that, that in our minds we say, ha ha, good for you. Right? But no. That's not, that's, that, that is, you know, you can tell, tell them off back if you want to stay within limits. But why are you happy that the guy tripped and broke his ankle? Because you have beef with him. You think, you think bad, you, you, there's enmity between you and them. This is why this happens often when there's, um, you know, or there's a competitor, or there's a rival in something, or you have some sort of antagonism with them. You know, you're happy that your, your neighbor who's been, you know, back and forth with you, something bad happened to them. And you're like, ah, I, it didn't happen to me. I'm happy with, about, about the problem happening with you. So, and the other thing where it comes up, unfortunately, a lot is in sectarianism amongst Muslims. Okay. So you're not in my group. You know, I believe my group is like, you know, whatever sect name, group name you have of Muslims. And for some reason, Muslims, uh, unfortunately, have been tricked by shaitan to be the most vile in their behavior towards their fellow Muslim who belongs in a different group. Like you wouldn't even talk like that to a non-Muslim. When it comes to trashing a Muslim preacher who you just have a slight difference of opinion, maybe fiqh opinion, aqidah opinion, maybe they went to a different madrasa, they go to a different mosque, you know, you call yourself one thing, they call themselves one thing, and all of a sudden something happens to that person and you're ready to just say, ha ha, you know, it's good that happened to you. So scandal breaks out. You, if a scandal breaks out against a person that you don't like, you should be praying to Allah that, that Allah covers up that thing for them. Not saying to tear down the thing even more. And this is why the ulama used to say that it is mustahab to not bear witness in court to the, uh, to the uh, had punishment of your brother or sister. For example, you know, you see someone committing adultery. Like what, there's a had punishment for that, right? It's a serious thing. The ulama say, what should, what should you do? Walk up to the mosque and the qadi, go to the court and say, I saw this person and accuse this person so they get punished for it? No. It's totally opposite. Islam teaches you, you see that, you turn the other way. You don't rat out your... Unless someone's hurting someone else, that's a different story. But they're doing a private sin by themselves. You don't go out and even, even get them in trouble for it. It's better for you to just leave them between them and Allah. You might talk to them, say, hey man, that's not a good thing. Come on, you know, you know I'm just giving you sincere advice, right? But even the ulama say, because you don't want to see your brother or sister in a problem. We're opposite today. We're opposite. Somebody from sect XYZ, they do a little thing, and you're going to repost, you're going to retweet, you're going to, you know, WhatsApp forward comes to you, so-and-so scholar found with, you know, some certain thing, and you're just like spreading it all over the place because it's not your group. 
And then when it happens to somebody in your group, you're all of a sudden like, let's cover it up, brother. Let's, you know, whatever. So this is inconsistent behavior that Muslims, uh, that Muslims display, subhanAllah. And this is why the Prophet said, listen to this now. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تظهر الشماتة لأخيك فيرحمه الله ويبتليك Kind of rhymes. Do not show joy at the misfortune of your brother lest Allah have mercy on him and afflict you with that misfortune or some other misfortune. In fact, there are other, there are other narrations that say anyone who tries to shame a Muslim brother or sister you know, in a, in a way embarrassing them about a sin that they committed that person will not die until Allah makes them commit that sin as well. And people think that they're so perfect, they'll never do that sin. Oftentimes it happens. You think you're so perfect, you'll never do that sin. So it's like, we really have to ask ourselves, you know, all the, you know, these kind of like energetic young guys who are trying to shame Muslim sisters on Instagram or whatever, and just for no reason, you know, spreading stuff about them. Oh, look how she's... Look how she's uh, posting up pictures of herself. Look this, 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 this. And in places where you don't even need to, there's no reason. You're just trying to bring someone else down because it makes you feel good. Right? It makes you feel good. Something happens to that person. Ha ha, su suits her well. And then subhanAllah, how do you know that you will not sin? You will not fall into the sin of looking at pictures like that. You, you are bl blaming someone else for being involved in something, but you're condemning them openly. And then you yourself fall into that thing. I mean, it's like, a, you know, there might be different ways of comparing it and explaining it. But you have to be very careful about that. So, and the funny thing is this as well. You know, you know something? A lot of the times, people who are most vocal about bringing people down in their sins, they're actually also sometimes doing those sins secretly. But as a way of covering it up, they, they become like, you know, righteous against other people. Oh man, look at you. You're, you're, you know, you're an abuser. You're, you're a, such a, you know, look at this is abuse. And like, meanwhile, you know, Ask his wife and kids how, how he is at home or whatever, you know, or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're shaming someone for the thing, the very thing that you're doing. You know, anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent, but subhanAllah, it, it shows you something. Never, never be happy when a Muslim, something happens bad to them, right? Rather always make dua for them and ask yourself, like, can I separate what they did to me and what's happening to them? Something they did bad to me, do I think, am I so arrogant that I think Allah is sending punishment from the sky on that person? I shouldn't even think that. Yeah, okay, you told me off. Now you tripped. Am I going to say uh, Allah made you trip? Right? So you, what you're saying, the arrogance is that, that my Lord like, punishes you from the sky because you, you upset me. But when I talk like that to somebody else, you know, I wouldn't want Allah to punish me like that. Right? So be careful when you start cursing and wishing ill on other people. So subhanAllah, a little bit of a turn, but we're going to uh, look at the last of the uh, sins of the tongue for tonight. Any questions so far about anything we talked about? All right. Online people as well, you guys can um, ask your questions or you can share examples as well if you, if you want to get clarification. The last one is al-fuhsh fil qawl, obscenity. Okay? It is using obscene speech. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنُ بِالطَّعَان بِالطَّعَان وَلَا الْلَعَان وَلَا الْفَاحِشْ وَلَا الْبَذِيعَ A little bit of a speech. Uh, typo. The Prophet ﷺ said the believer is not given to reviling. He's not basically, he's not the type of person that insults other people. He's not the type of, he or she is not the type of person that curses other people. Nor, it, nor are they an obscene person. Nor are they vulgar. So what does that mean? Like a believer? Does that mean you're not a believer if you say the F word? No, come on, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that, that the personality you're still, you're a Muslim, of course, but a believer, they should be striving to clean, the, clean their speech of bad words and bad types of speaking to people. So, for example, like, if you're the type of person that the minute you get angry at someone, it's just like, beep, 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 beep. you know, it's like, as soon as you get into a con, <laughs> that's not like the behavior of a believer, right? That's why the Prophet is saying that that's not the, you know, you're Muslim, alhamdulillah, of course you have iman, but let's learn a little bit of the adab of Islam before you start, you know. Or, for example, <clears throat> people, get some, people get upset with somebody, and immediately they start saying, may Allah curse you, may Allah do this to you, may Allah do that to you. And some cultures, they have that a lot. In fact, so the bad thing is, some cultures, parents curse their kids. I'm like, you know, what? How, how silly is that? The dua of a, of a parent is accepted, but that, you know what that is? That's nafs. It's not because it's you don't want good for your child. You want them to listen to you because of you, who you are. 
This is nafs in parenting. And we should never do this. We should always be careful, especially if our cultures contain, you know, curses to other people. And I've heard this in, in cultures as well. Oh, lanat on these people, curses on these people. It's like, you just, what are you cursing people for, you know? Is that, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, subhanAllah, the, the, the Sahaba came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there was a group of the mushrikeen who were, you know, harming the Muslims. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, say a curse for these people. You know, and everyone's probably like getting to get, getting ready to say Ameen. He said, I was not sent as a person who curses other people. Like he could have done that. Like there were, there were tribes. I mean, Abu Sufyan fought against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for his whole life. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have lifted his hand and said, oh, you know, that's it. But the, the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do that. And Abu Sufyan became Muslim at the end of his life, towards the end of the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Just imagine that. Right? But there were some people, subhanAllah, that, were, that, that did receive that because Allah knew that they didn't have any good inside their hearts. They, Allah knew they don't have any good inside their hearts. So when they were torturing, when they were doing the wrong, actually Abu Sufyan was actually, he had some principles as well. There were some people who had absolutely no principles. And, and, uh, and so the Prophet ﷺ was not sent generally to curse people. It doesn't mean that no one was cursed if they were truly evil. But he would give people a chance to turn around. Now, getting back to the point, it's about being obscene and vulgar, right? The Prophet ﷺ also said, مَا كَانَ الْفُحْشْ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَ وَمَا كَانَ الْحَيَاءُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ Again, beautifully rhyming, you know, <laughs> a way of saying something. It's not meant to be poetry, but it's just a beautiful way of saying it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Anything that contains obscenity or vulgarity is made ugly by it. And whatever contains modesty is made beautiful by it. When you, see a, when you meet a person, and let's say they're very good looking, right? They're very good looking. And out of their mouth, just, just dirty talk. Just obscene talk. When you see the person again, something about that, th their beauty and the way they carry themselves and the way you respect them just kind of falls a little bit, you know? Even if the person's in a very high station, in a very high office, look at a politician, somebody who's supposed to be very respected, the minute they start talking dirty and bad and whatever, immediately respect for that person falls. This is what Rasulullah says I'm saying. Anything with obscenity in it, it just looks bad. It just, it just disfigures it. But when you see haya in someone, there's nothing more beautiful than haya. Allahu Akbar. This is why, subhanAllah, one of the ulama, um, I believe it was, was it Imam Sha'rawi or Shaykh al Buti uh, was mentioning, I forget who it was, but they were mentioning that when they were a, a teenager, a young, a young person, they'd be dressed in a religious dress and going to their classes. And they were a handsome, you know, young person. And they would notice the girls were like looking at them and oogling them, you know. And they're like, he, so they wondered like, what's up? Like, I'm, I'm dressed like, he's dressed like a madrasa student. He's not dressed like a like a like a slick movie star or something. Why why is he getting that attention from these teenage girls, right? And somebody explained to him it's because of the the the, the modesty that you carry yourself with, that it creates a type of a nur, it beautifies you, and so it attracts people to look at you. Subhanallah, right? So this is why as well, like Subhanallah, there's there, it, 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 someone with a sound, someone with a sound heart, when they see a person being modest to them, that is beautiful. And when they see someone being vulgar, that is not beautiful, right? And subhanAllah, sometimes our, even, our, even our tastes and our attitudes have sh shifted because we're in this society. So for example, like some of the ulama, you know, who have kept themselves, you know, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they see someone ravishingly beautiful, but vulgarly dressed, what did they say? Oh God, you know, like they don't like it. It actually doesn't even look good to them. And when they see somebody very modestly dressed, then they, they get bashful and shy. SubhanAllah. Where it's opposite. Here, people see somebody vulgar and they get attracted to that. And they see somebody shy and modest and they're like, you're not attractive. What's wrong with you? Look a little better sometimes. You know, come on. So this is why it goes back to the heart that's coming out of. Now, the uh, Imam Nawawi says, obscenity and vulgarity are forbidden. Right? They're, 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 not, they're not permitted. As is attested to by many Sahih Hadiths. And what does obscenity mean? It means to express something that is ugly or vulgar in plain words. It's to say it in words, even if they're true and even if it's honest. So sometimes people say words and it's like, you know, I'm just saying the truth. It's just honest. You know, and, and it's not just about saying the truth and being honest. It's about is it right for that context at that time, right? Rather, people should be express vulgar things by being polite in a way that conveys what is meant 
but not being direct about it, right? You guys all right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, like, for example, the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, lakum rafathu ila nisa'ikum. Allah says, it is permitted for you on the days of your fasts to go unto your wives. Okay? It's not explicit, but we all get what Allah is talking about, right? Like, we don't have to spell it out, right? You know? So, so that's why Allah Himself sometimes uses those allusions to not say it exactly. And for example, Allah says, وَكَيْفَ تَأْخُذُونَهُ وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَى بعض. Allah asks the men, the husbands, when they divorce their wives, how can you take back the mahr? How can you take back the gift that you gave your wife, right? When you have, when you have, um, when you have entered into one another, it's like it's even that is like much more clear, but it's still not saying the exact word, right? Um, again, Allah says, "وَإِن تَلَقَتُمُهُنَّ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تَمَسُّهُنَّ," and if you divorce them before you have touched them, does it literally mean you touch them? No, it doesn't mean that, obviously, right? So there are many words, there are many verses and, and hadiths that talk like this. So the ulama say, for example, that um, you should also be reserved in how you, how you say things. So for example, instead of sexual intercourse, they'll say things like going unto, marital relations, lovemaking. Now I can say these words right now because we're in a, in a majal of ta'aleem. We're in a place of learning and teaching. So I can say words that normally outside you wouldn't, you wouldn't like. I'm not saying you can't say sex. I'm not saying you can't say that. But it's not considered the best thing to say in the best company, you know. So, you know, depending on the on the thing. So instead of saying words like copulate, sex, this kind of stuff, or even worse words than that, if you can think of them, you know, you would say things like marital relations, conjugal relations, you know, things like that. Even like things like um, answering the call of nature. Don't we say I need to go to the bathroom? Right? You don't say I need to urinate. You don't. Nobody says like, oh, you know, if you want to defecate, it's right, right over there, because it's like. Considered like, come on, that's, vulgar, that's a little vulgar, right? So you say, can I use the bathroom? Or I got to go, or, you know, I need to visit the, the men's room or something like that. And so even mentioning people's flaws should also be done by polite words. You know, the word that they use for someone who's blind in the Arab world, you know what they call them? Basir, someone who can see. That's how, that's how, that's how, how much respect they refer to someone. Because, you know, you call someone like that, and then they hear it, they, may, they, they might get hurt. They're feeling, or you just reminded them. So instead of calling someone by a fault, you know, you call someone by that. You know, um, you know there's other types of ways to express, you know, things as well. Um, let's see, what else is there? However, when the need arises, when you have to teach someone, and you have to put something in their mind, and they're not going to get it if you, you know, use metaphors and allusions, or they misunderstand, then you should name the real thing that we're talking about, right? Then you have to name the real thing. Sometimes when you're teaching fiqh and, you know, you're, you're saying like, you know, your teacher is saying, for example, you know, often it comes out about intercourse or something like that. Oh, go from the front, not the back. It's like somebody like, what do you mean? What is that talking about? Then you have to say, no, this, no, this. This is what it means. And sometimes when your teacher says it too, you're like, you know, like a big shake saying words that you're like not used to hearing him saying. But, you know, it's something that as well changes from society to society. I'll give you an example that's not in the text. Um, the Prophet uh, actually, like, and I'm just say, saying this because it's an example of when you need to be very clear. So, um, an example of that. Uh, he, Ubay bin Kaab, a man was boasting in front of him about his family lineage. Like he was saying, I'm from this tribe and I have this pride in my tribe and whatever. So Ubay bin Kaab told him to go bite his male, his father's private part. Okay? He sort of told him that. And he did not use a metaphor. He used the real word. Okay? And I'm not, even I'm not using the real word. Right? And you can tell what word he used. And he said, go and do that. So everybody was like, whoa, what did you just say? You're Sahaba of Rasulullah, companion of the Prophet How are you talking? And he said, Ka'b ibn Ubay said, I can see what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. How could I say that as a Sahaba? I can only tell you this. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu instructed us, if you hear someone boasting about his lineage, tribal lineage, in, the ma in an ignorant manner, like t in the pre-Islamic times, then tell him to go bite his father's male private part and do not use a metaphor. The Prophet instructed the people, tell him do that and don't use the metaphor. Why? Because immediately it would shock you. 
And what he's saying is, I mean, like at the end of the day, if you even want to get into that, it's like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a pretty bad thing. Family pride is what caused people to become oppressed. My family can own your family because we're like this and you're like this. We can treat you like this because like this. I can get away with murder because I'm from such and such a clan. You guys are weak. I can harass your daughter. I can take your land. So, so, so Islam came to end all this thing that your family is better than your family. So anybody who gets caught, Prophet is saying, bringing up that type of pride that would make you think you're better than other people, then tell him, like, what are you really? What is your pride? Where do you come from? Your father's what? What do you come from? So that's why it's like, understand where you are. Come back to size. We're all from that uh, dirty drop. We're all from earth. So this is why the Prophet is saying, instructing people, do this and do not use a metaphor. Don't skirt around the issue because I want people to know I said this and I'm very serious about it. Right? So this is an example. It wasn't in the text, so, but it gives you an example when you need to be serious, right? Because it's about Islam, it's about the truth. Alhamdulillah. So, inshallah khair, that's the end of um, our, our uh, sins of the tongue for tonight. Um, are there any questions that people have or anything that's on their mind? Question? Okay, so there's a difference. That's a very good question. So some of the question was, so what if someone is from the, the Sada or the Sayyids or the, the Shurafa, meaning they're from a prophetic lineage, right? And they're speaking about that, and then you're saying, so what, do you think you're better than us? This is talking about boasting about, a prophetic, uh, boasting about your tribal lineage. When someone says, you know, and you shouldn't even boast about that, even if you're from, mashallah, Allah blessed you to be born in the prophetic household from the Ahl Bayt, you know, the way of the Ahl Bayt actually is that they don't, they don't boast about these things, you know. In fact, other people, uh, uh, you know, admire these things. The Prophet said, um, uh, the one who his deeds will slow him down and keep him back, his lineage will not bring him forward. The Prophet said that. Whoever's deeds keep him back, his lineage will not push him forward. So that's one thing, if the person doesn't understand that, but to boast about it, now you wouldn't, you'd have to be careful. Because how can you judge if the person is boasting about it? Does anybody from a Sayyid say, we can do every, anything we want to other people? No one says that. But in Jahili times, they had, they had these kind of like, you know what, like a caste system, for example. You still have it in, even amongst Muslims, subhanAllah. I'm from this caste or this baradari or this jati or whatever you call it. And I, uh, therefore, you know, we're better than these people. They can't marry into our family. That's boasting, Right. But you, I've, uh, subhanAllah, I can't say I've heard anybody personally, uh, and I, knowing their intention, trying to say, boast about their tribal lineage in such a way that it's a jahili way, and their Sayyid from the Prophet I honestly, even, even that type of person, I would just rather give, give them the benefit of the doubt. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that you guys should go and apply this hadith without thinking about it. Like, hey, you go bite, you, you know, be careful, you know, because you should be very, very sure that that's what's happening. This is jahili times when the Arabs were just out of, uh, into Islam, and they were still competing with their tribes, right? So it's important to know that, alhamdulillah. Um, there's a question here online that says, um, how do you act or react to name calling or verbal abuse towards oneself or others? How does Islam recommend to deal with it? That's a very good question. There are two ways to deal with it, right? The Prophet Wasallam, when a group of the people of the book were passing by the Prophet Wasallam. uh, you know, they used to have a kind of a, a, a way that they would insult the Prophet ﷺ, but they wouldn't do it directly to his face. Instead of saying, As-salamu alaykum, they would say, As-salamu alaykum. They in, so instead of saying, may peace be upon you, they would say, may, may death be upon you. Because Sam was a word in their, uh, in their religious, in their language, that uh, meant death. So they would like quickly say it, and they would pass by. You know, like when you're passing by, you say something, and you and you and you make people laugh and you make people snicker, but the person doesn't hear, so you think you made a joke. So they passed by the Prophet ﷺ. They said "Assalamu alaikum," and the Prophet ﷺ said "Wa alaikum," said and and to you as well. So Aisha heard, caught the insult, and she started going, "Oh yeah, 
you people, this, 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 this. And she started answering them back. And, Aisha, and, and the Prophet said, stop, Aisha, stop. You know, have gentleness. Basically, he said that, you know, that Allah loves gentleness to the near meaning. I forgot the exact hadith. But, um, and then she said, don't you hear what they said to you? And he said, yeah, but didn't you hear what I said back? I said back to you. And my dua is accepted. <laughs> Theirs is not going to be accepted. So from there, you know that if someone's calling you something, you know, and you have to kind of defend yourself, you know, you can, Islam doesn't expect you to be a doormat. Someone's yelling at you and swearing at you and you're just like, okay, no problem. Tell me anything you want. No, that's not how we are, right? That's a higher level though. But it's not, you can't expect that from everybody. So someone's saying, you know, oh, you go to this, you do this, you do this. And you're angry. You can contain yourself by simply saying, no, back to you, same to you. No, no, you, you do that, you know, or, you know, whatever, you know, in your face, whatever. You say it back to them in such a way um, but you don't cross that limit. Because how, how do fights actually start? Someone says something, someone says something else. Someone pushes, someone punches. There, and then the knife comes out. That's how it escalates. But Islam is not saying you have to defend yourself sometimes. So you can say, you know, you say something back, but according to the limit about how they said it, or you try to push them back. But there's another higher level. And that is idfa billati hiya ahsan. That this is where ihsan comes. Yes, okay, you're permitted within reason to answer the person back. But then, if you listen to Allah's advice, come back with something that is better than what they said. And then Allah will make what is between you and a person who you have enmity with as if you guys were good friends. Because if you decide to answer with a better act, like for I'll give you an example, right? Someone tries to come and hit you. And instead of hitting them back, which, you know, when you're in a self-defense situation, I would tell any of my kids, if they come to get into a fight at school, you better hit that guy back, right? That's, that's how, you know, no, I mean, I did the opposite when I was young. It's not the best thing. <laughs> don't run, don't always run to the teacher, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, you might have to sometimes. But, you know, no, you defend yourself. But if you catch a guy's hand or a girl's hand, whatever, and you put them in a lock and you put them on the ground and you just leave them and they realize that you can, you can fight them, but you decided not to do that, right? Who, who, you know, you did something in such a way that, when their anger subsides, they'll realize, all right, this guy could have beat me, but he didn't do it. You know? Or you, they say something insulting to you, and you say, oh yeah, you know what I can say about you? I know about you. You want to know what I know about you? And they say, do you want me to say it? And they're like, oh no, no, no. Don't say it, don't say it. And you say, all right, we're just going to leave that right there. Now you come off bigger in that sense. Right? But you did it for the sake of Allah, because like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to leave you. And that person now feels, and what happens is, they're angry about it, but they're not as angry as if you had answered them. But you at least gave a chance for them to come back and say, yo, I shouldn't have said that to you. I'm really sorry. You know, all right, no problem. So this is a higher level if someone is verbally abusing you or something to, to try to do that. Same thing goes, and I'm sorry to say this, in, um, in spousal conflict as well. It's so easy when fights happen that you say this and she says this and pretty soon it's like cat and dog, right? And to be honest with you, even with physical abuse, uh, many times, it just doesn't go one way. It was actually happening both ways, but one person did it worse than the other. It could happen too. So the person who says, they bite their tongue and they say, I can say this. I'm not going to say this in front of my kids or whatever thing you're going to say. And you just say, all right, and you walk away. Then at least you did not, that person can realize their fault. So inshallah, that's, I hope that kind of answers the question. There is a base level of defense, but there's a higher level of you know, um, of doing the better thing and you get rewarded for that. Um, yeah, inshallah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, I forgot you're the martial arts person. You're right. You know, sometimes you do have to meet force with force, but then rise above that as well to show that you're not as bad as your oppressor. Is there a question or is that like a scratching in the back of... Okay, yeah. Oh, I thought you said tasing. I was like, I was like tasing somebody. Sister, no, you can't do that. <laughs> um, no, is it teasing somebody? Look, if it's all a joke, it's, it's, it's all good, you know? Like, if both people are happy at the end of the day, then it's all fun. Like, you've increased, the Prophet would, would, would joke with people, right? 
But when it's when it's something where you break that person's heart, you know, you make a joke about someone's I don't know hair, weight, whatever, and everyone laughs, but that person's hurt inside. That person pretends to laugh. Inside, they're crushed. You know, you broke the heart of another Muslim. You know, but if it's like light teasing, such that you know, oh, it's like your friend at camp making a fool out of himself. You posted it on your on your Instagram story. Just say ha ha ha. You know, it's all good. You know, you embarrass the groom a little bit in a speech. You kind of like roast them. You know, it's it's all good, right? But the thing is, you have to know. You know, it's an art to do that. And if you if you do that in such a way, this is why the ulama actually say, be careful with joking, because joking often um, breaks relationships. Sometimes, you know, if you're a desi, then you probably have somebody in the family that people are not talking to, unfortunately, you know. And often it comes sometimes it doesn't come out of a fight about inheritance, although it often does. But it comes sometimes out of um, we were at the Eid party and they said something and oh, it was like a slick comment and people laughed. I didn't like it. I'm not inviting you for Eid. You know, so you got to be careful about jokes. They run deep, especially with spouses as well. You said on June the 1st, 2008, you know, <laughs> it's like you got to be careful. People will remember when they get hurt. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who purify our tongues, purify our hearts, inshallah, use our uh, everything we've been given for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call people towards him and inshallah to get his good pleasure. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, see you guys next time. Assalamu